Hello, everyone. My guest today is Jonathan Lacoste. He is uh, the co-founder and president of Jebit, an enterprise software company in the digital marketing and consumer data space. His focus is on helping the world's largest brands create a declared data strategy using explicitly consented data and their digital marketing channels. Jonathan, you ready to take us to the top? Sounds good. Good All to right. be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So first off, give us some definitions here. What does declared data mean? Declared data is a type of consumer data where customers are actually declaring or sharing information with brands. So quite simply, it can be answering a question in a piece of content, or it could be filling out some information uh, in a survey or a lead form. So let me ask you a question. Facebook right now, they, they, they were just shut down by Apple, a certain app that they had because they were paying consumers to essentially give them access to their data. I actually said, wow, this is great. At least Facebook's paying people for their data. Most people just collect it without even telling the consumer at all. However, the storyline that took off online was very much the opposite, which was, wow, Facebook is, they're breaking privacy laws, they're capturing all this data, when really most companies do it anyway and never pay the consumer. So don't we want to see more companies, Google, Apple, offering to pay consumers for their data? Yeah, I think it's interesting. We always talk about a value-based exchange where companies, if they're going to collect and use consumer data, there needs to be an enhancement to the experience. So a personalized recommendation or some type of value, maybe even monetary, like that's totally in the realm. Yeah. I think where Facebook overstepped here in particular is they used a protocol with Apple where it was only supposed to be an internal employee app and they kind of kept it secret and used it as an external market research tool, breaking Apple's rules. And then there's always kind of the you know iffy line of it, it, it monitors everything you did on your mobile device for people all the way uh, as young as 13 and 14 years old. So I think it gets to kind of the ethical question of how much data is too much to share with these companies and what should consumers be able to control and when should they be able to give it? Yeah, this is very interesting. For those people who really like the idea of universal basic income for these big tech companies that love data so much, I actually could see potentially a way to fund UBI as being these tech companies paying every consumer in the US a grand a month, right, for access to the data and it's essentially opt-in by consumers because they value the data so much. It's really interesting. I think what you're hitting on is we are moving quickly to a world where consumers will own their data and it could be treated as a fundamental human right. And companies have to respect that and treat that data a lot differently. Whether we ever get to the point to, to your idea around, you know, monetizing it or like a basic income, totally, totally open for discussion. But what certainly is true that consumers are going to have a lot more control of their data moving forward than in the past. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Okay, so how's Jebit fit in the picture here? What do you guys do? Are you I mean, is it a SaaS company or what? Yeah, it's a SaaS platform and, and enterprises all around the world right now are being faced with the challenge of how do we collect and use this data in a really transparent and simple way that not only drives business value, but is also respectful for everything that we just talked about with the consumer. And so um, enterprise companies license our technology. The short answer is they build these immersive mobile experiences. They launch it as a part of their digital strategy with the whole goal of giving consumers the ability to share what they want to share with enterprises, the preferences, motivations, so that enterprises can immediately alter the experience and give them a more personalized and relevant, uh, you know, shopping experience or browsing experience as a part of their journey. Mm -hmm. um, is this the kind of data that an Expedia might use to know it's a Mac user, not a PC user and charge 10 times the airline prices because they assume the Mac user has more money? <laughs> That's inferred data. So a lot of the data that they're looking to get from uh, customers is really just understanding on a conversational level, like, why are you searching? So if, if Expedia sees you searching for a flight to Hong Kong, uh, they may see your location and what device you're browsing and all of those things. But with Jebit, they want to understand the why behind the action. Okay. Why are you okay. going? What motivations, uh, you know, is it for uh, with a spouse or is it for a, a honeymoon or just a friend's weekend? When you arrive, what type of hobbies are you interested in? I think in an ideal world, consumer data sometimes is, is treated too much as kind of this programmatic transactional exchange between consumer and brand. And we're trying to add a human element to it to make it a little bit more relevant to consumers. Interesting. Okay. And then help me understand kind of who you're selling to. The average customer is paying about how much per year for your technology? It's a, uh, it's a six figure contract. I mean, we're selling okay. to, you okay. know, working with the largest brands in the world. Um, and at the end of the day, we're selling into product and marketing teams. Primarily. Okay. So fair to say then again, just to be clear, the average kind of ACV, even in year one is above a hundred grand. And, Correct. and why would someone pay a hundred grand per year versus a million, right? Per year? What, what are the pricing axes you pricing against? I think it's all about how much they're using the platform. So, um, you know, we're based here in Boston. And so we primarily focus on companies in North America, but Pretty frequently, when our customers in North America find success, they refer us to other divisions within their company, or they refer us to their European or Asian counterparts. So I think as the platform continues to expand internally, and they upgrade with certain features or the usage increases, um, that's when you start to... Uh, based to, off to what, though? Usage based off what? What's the metric? 
Well, new teams are licensing it. They're launching more experiences. Uh, more consumers are going through it and they're collecting more data. So uh, a variety of factors. Okay. So just to be clear, you, you have an inside sales team that says, hey, you are moving from a team size of 100 to 1,000. You should pay more. Or you're, you, know, you should add this feature set across all your seats. You should pay more. Or hey, you just passed a million consumers through your experience in one month. You should move to like the next level. Yeah, we see a lot of uh, enterprises start based on where they're at in their declared data journey, right? Like we're, we're building a category as a SaaS platform. And so a lot of customers are coming to us and they don't know necessarily what technology they need to solve these problems. So to your point around pricing and packaging, a lot of the time what we do is we start someone on the basic platform, which gives them a certain number of experiences, a certain number of interactions. And then as they need more advanced capabilities, unique custom APIs, more integrations into their CRM and DMP, more experiences to launch in more regions, that's when you start moving up those price points. So on average, what do you see contract values increase from percentage wise from year one to year two? Are we talking doubling or 50% growth or 10% or what? Uh, it totally depends, but most of our customers are doubling or tripling their spend within the first uh, 12 months, which I think is a really exciting um, metric that we keep track of because it directly correlates to value. Now, obviously, um, the doubling can't keep going per account year over year. Otherwise, you'd be a multi-billion dollar company at this point. You, obviously, people kind of flatten out. So when you look after kind of the rapid acceleration up to a certain price point over the first 18 to 24 months, I mean, do you see it kind of calm down where expansion year over year is maybe like whatever, 10, 20 percent? Uh, we're not even at that point yet, to be honest, right? I mean, as a, as a SaaS company that's, you know, three years into building the category, a lot of what our focus has been is just continuing to add customer value. And these enterprises we're dealing with are at such a scale that um, we keep finding new global teams to work with, new new brands, new divisions. So we're still kind of at that point where we're still accelerating. When did you launch? Uh, the company's been around seven years, but we formally announced Declare Data kind of at our customer conference at the beginning of 2017. So it's been uh, over two years now of just kind of really focusing on building the category. Okay, but, but I mean, you have some. I mean, you have some history here, though. It's not like you don't have any cohort data to analyze. So 2012 was launch date. You were always a SaaS company, right? Or were you like an on-prem kind of thing, and you morphed to a SaaS company? Yeah, we we've had a, a couple of different um, evolutions. We were a, a marketplace for a period of time. Launched our SaaS offering in 2015. Okay. Focused specifically on mobile interactive content to the mid market, and then we shifted to an enterprise uh, software solution focused on this larger declared data challenge at the beginning of 2017. And how have you driven this growth in terms of capitalization, bootstrapped or raised? We've raised uh, a couple rounds of VC, and um, primarily a lot of the growth has been from again land and expand uh, type go-to-market strategy with customers. We have a couple of really key partnerships we're excited about. So Snapchat and Twitter uh, are, are partners of ours where we have a unique relationship where their sales and customer success teams can also sell the Jevit platform. And so we find a lot of value in those partnerships. Okay, so raise to date about how much? Uh, just over 10 million. Okay, 10. And all that was priced equity or any debt or venture debt or anything? Uh, no, all priced. All priced. Okay, great. And then um, round out the team for me today. How many folks? Uh, 54 full-time employees uh, here in Boston, uh, Austin, Texas, and in New York. Austin, very good. That's great. And um, okay, so 54 folks, and how many of them are focused on kind of onboarding sales, marketing? Uh, half the company is sales, marketing, customer success, and partnerships, and the other half is product engineering. Okay, the reason I ask, I'm curious, I mean, how aggressive are you being in terms of CAC? So if year one ACV is 100 grand, are, we, are you willing to spend that whole amount for a 12-month payback, or how aggressive are you being with acquisition? No, I mean, we've been pretty lean, if anything. I mean, I think because so much of our growth, and this is something that we talk a lot about when we think about SaaS unit economics, so much of our growth is coming organically from customer referrals internally expansion. We have unique partnerships, and so we're able to get lead generations of customers that are interested in what we're doing without putting a ton of paid dollars behind it. So a very early uh, and intent, uh, uh, thoughtful part of our go-to-market strategy was really around what are the unfair advantages we can have to keep that CAC low. And those were two of the areas we wanted to lean in on. Okay, but just to be clear, when you look at fully weighted, it's not just drug paid spend you're looking at. If you have a sales team that's half your company, obviously there's commission structures built in there, you know, their desk space, all kinds of their software you pay per employee to use Yesware or whatever you're using. So when you look at fully weighted, I mean, what are you paying fully weighted to get a new dollar of ARR? Uh, still a very small percentage. We have a five person sales team. So um, again, a lot of this is, is genuinely from, uh, you know, our, our three person partnerships team working with, uh, uh, the partners to get an inbound lead or our customer success team working to get an introduction. So. Okay. So if you, so if the CAC number is a harder question to answer, let me ask it differently again. Ha what kind of payback period are you happy with three, you know, three months, 12 months, 24 months? I mean, we're, we're happy in the three to six month range. The, the SAS VCs of the world, uh, the, the best ones will tell you anything sub 12 in enterprise software. Yeah. 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 No, no, I don't care about them. I care about, I, I want to be about you, right? So like you've optimized for, it sounds like less than essentially a three month payback period. Okay. And, and so 
why not be more aggressive, right? Knowing that the standards are much higher than that. I mean, by the way, there's nothing wrong with a quick payback. I think it's wonderful. The best payback is like zero, right? But um, why not be more aggressive? Aggressive in what sense? Hiring? Well, I, I have no idea. I don't know your business, but have you identified ways to be more aggressive or is that the exact problem? You don't actually know how you'd be more aggressive if you tried. No, I mean, I think we have a pretty clear roadmap. We tripled the business this past year and, and we've had a lot of really interesting conversations about what, what 2019 will be. Uh, we're at 55 employees now. The the roadmap has us uh, getting closer to, to 80 or 90 by the end of the year. So there's a pretty clear plan for enterprise sales rep going direct to brand and, and continuing to build the enterprise pipeline. Uh, one area we do want to invest more in is partnerships. So I mentioned Snapchat and Twitter. There's about a dozen more that are in the works right now that we haven't announced. Um, and so those are areas that we're definitely going to lean in on uh, this year. What's the incentive you pay for those for those partners to come to the table? Is there some kind of kickback or rev share or value add? Why do they do it? No, I mean, if anything, the, the incentive is that they get to bring a new solution to their customers that they feel a genuine pain, pain, pain point for. So because of regulation, GDPR in Europe, California has a state initiative that is going to become law January 1, 2020, just 11 months from now. Everyone has to be evaluating how they collect and use consumer data. And in the marketing and the advertising world, the entire infrastructure, infrastructure and ecosystem is built on collecting and using third party, first party inferred data without consent. And so everyone's being forced to think through different solutions that help them. And Jeb, it's one of those solutions. Okay. But if this is going to be so critical, right, to these companies, I mean, why on earth would they, would they basically outsource this via you? Wouldn't they want to be building this internally? Well, there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a couple of ways to think about this. So one is everyone's going to build the infrastructure internally to a certain extent or on their owned properties. Um, everyone is already leveraging kind of the infrastructure from like a technology standpoint of their, their pure marketing tech stack, their CRM, their DMP, et cetera. Um, but, this is exactly what we've been focused on solving for the best for the past five years. And there's something to be said about kind of being really laser focused on one unique niche problem and pain point. Um, and so we've built a platform as opposed to in the marketing space, you hear a lot about CDPs, consumer data platforms that are trying to help you collect and combine a lot of the data. So a uh, long way of saying we're pretty uniquely focused on this and, and no one else in the space is really focused on solving this problem as of today. Okay, and how effective have you been? You mentioned you've been doing this for kind of five years. How many customers have you scaled to? Yeah, I mean, publicly, we talk about uh, just under 100 enterprise customers. Um, again, we've built the business in the retail and e-commerce space, travel and hospitality, um, media, entertainment, sports leagues and teams, um, consumer packaged goods. I mean, these are the big categories that we find um, have the biggest need for first party declared data. Mm -hmm. So, Jonathan, I mean, just south of 100, let's just say you mean 90 by that 90 times $100,000 price point will put you at about 750 grand a month right now in revenue. And in terms of MRR, is that about right? Uh, yeah, we're not allowed to talk, uh, figures, but, uh, you can, you can extrapolate off that. Well, yeah. And just to be clear, I'm, I don't want to make anything up. These are numbers you gave me directly. These are direct quotes. You said less than a hundred customers and you said a hundred thousand dollar year one ACV. Yep. Both of those are true. Okay. So three X year over year growth. That means about a year ago, you'd be about again, one third of seven fifty. So call it maybe two fifty, something like that. Uh, yeah, again, really not allowed to comment. We're going through a financing, uh, uh, sequence right now, but um, yeah, those are those are the things we're allowed to talk about publicly. Yeah, uh, again, Jonathan, I'm I, I'm not I'm not asking you to share anything you haven't already shared. I'm multiplying things you've already shared. So you said three x year over year growth. You said less than 100 customers. I said 90. So you said 100 thousand dollar ACV. That would put you at 750 today. One third of that is 250. Is there anything that are, are any of the inputs you gave me leading me to wrong math? Yeah, I, I think uh, under 100 customers, I, I wouldn't pick 90 specifically, but um, yeah, we're we're really excited about the the tripling of growth and. I think we're going to try and aim to 2.5 or 3x the business again this year. Okay. Yeah. And, and look, the reason I ask this question is because a lot of times people will say we 100x year over year or 10x year over year. And it, it, it deceives my audience because it's easy to go from a dollar to $10 and call it 10x year over year growth. You see what I'm saying? And that's a very different, you learn something different than someone going from a million bucks a month to 2 million bucks a month. So from what I'm hearing you say, and I won't push any harder than this, you're saying less than 100, maybe not quite 90, but we look forward to getting there pretty soon. Uh, and part of the process of how we're going to do that is raise some capital capital right now to fuel some growth. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're, we're on the same page. Since you're in that, those kinds of conversations right now, you strike me as a very intelligent guy. So you want to make sure you have as much leverage as possible. Did you wait until you got the company back to break even from the 10.2 you've already raised before you start going out and raising now, or are you still burning a little bit? No, our strategy has always been to, uh, to, to, to burn. We're not, uh, we haven't taken the, uh, the other route. Okay. So you are still burning today. So you have a finite runway. You have to raise X by X amount. Otherwise you can't do payroll next month. Um, I mean, theoretically, if we kept any SaaS startup that's burning at that rate, that that's definitely how the economics will work out. But um, we have a, a, a diminishing burn rate. Let's just put it that way. Got it. So. You, you you can you can decrease it by cutting some you know variable expenses if you needed to. 
one of one of my favorite things about the SaaS model and um, with, with high retention rates and with a partnership ecosystem is um, o- over time, as you know, as your expense base increases, um, your growth rate increases at, at a much faster rate. So uh, we have been very fortunate to surround ourselves with some world class advisors. Uh, I mean, Bill Bill Masaitis, the former CRO CMO of, of, of Slack Technologies, is one of our board observers. Uh, we, we work with a lot of folks at Salesforce and Adobe as well. Um, we've kind of really tried to architect this to be scalable um, to many, many folds beyond uh, what we're talking about today. Yeah, no, that's great. And then um, last question, last question, your first 10 customers you got, what were you doing to hustle to get those first guys or gals? Oh man, uh, cold, cold outreach on LinkedIn, showing up to networking events and, and, and introducing yourself, um, trying to get customer referrals. Um, I think uh, yeah, all, th- all three of those have, have candidly turned out to be some of our largest customers as well. And just so. quickly, the targeting on LinkedIn, what were the keywords? Um, or, no, not even paid advertising. I'm saying going to like a marketing event and, and just shaking hands and doing cold outreach, like physically messaging people on LinkedIn. What was one of the first marketing kind of events you went to? Uh, in Boston, we have a lot of these uh, like ad club or like uh, my text is an organization locally. They'll hold e-commerce summits. And so what we found to do and what I talked to a lot of other SaaS founders about is instead of going to these big shows like South by Southwest and Dreamforce, find an audience of a couple hundred people talking about a really niche problem, either in a specific vertical category or type of buyer um, and go and kind of network in the room. And that's always worked really well for us. Yeah, very good. All right, let's wrap up here quickly. Famous five, one word answers. Number one, favorite business book. Bad blood. Number two. <laughs> <laughs> I number, had to, I number two. Is there a CEO you're following or studying? Um, Benioff. Number three. What's your favorite? Or sorry, what billing tool do you guys use? Billing tool. Um, Raidu. Spell it. Uh, R Y D O O. I think. Uh, Expensive buy competitor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Number four. How many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, six. And six. what's your situation? Married, single, kids? Uh, girlfriend. <laughs> okay. So not married, no kids yet. And how, are, how old are you? Yeah. Uh, 25. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Um, be more patient and be more, um, thankful. Guys, be patient, be thankful. Launch in 2012. Again, Jebit, really trying to help folks understand declared data, remove any ambiguity around who owns what data, and really creating safety for brands and knowing that they can do whatever they want with data collected from consumers in this particular way. Less than 100 customers paying, call it 100,000 bucks per year in terms of ACV growing 3X year over year. 10.2 million bucks raised so far. A team of 54 in Boston, Austin, and New York City. You know, CAC and payback periods, you know, three month payback periods. So healthy economics as they look to scale and potentially raise here shortly. Jonathan, thank you for taking us to the top. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan.